welcome to the Speaking of Women's Health podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Holly Thacker, and I am back in the house with another Dr. Holly, Dr. Holly Peterson. And it's really my pleasure to uh, invite her into the Sunflower House. She has been a frequent contributor on our speakingofwomenshealth.com nonprofit site. She is a staff physician, and she is the director of breast services in the Breast Center at Cleveland Clinic. And she's currently an associate professor, soon to be full professor at Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. And her medical practice has really been cutting edge and trailblazing and focuses on breast diagnostics, breast cancer risk assessment, and management of the high-risk patient. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Biochemistry from the University of California, Santa Barbara, where she received the distinction of Phi Beta Kappa. She then went on to earn her medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, where she was Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. So was I. People always mix us up. They think we're twins. We're actually (laughs) not. Even though we're both Dr. Hollies, we both are the mother of three children. So in 2008, she completed a clinical fellowship in the prestigious Genomics Institute at Cleveland Clinic, and she has been directing the medical breast program, is active in clinical research, and she presents internationally. Welcome, Dr. Holly Peterson. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Thacker. And, you know, I, I've, I've always kind of thought of myself as the other Holly. <laughs> you, you were, you've been <laughs> such a trailblazer, and, you know, I just want to thank you for all you've done for, for women, for women's health, for speaking of women's health, for training people, the fellowship and the legacy that that you'll leave behind with all of the people that that you've uh, that you've educated, including myself, and you know you've really been a role model for for all of us. And and I wanted to thank you and thank you for having me here today. Well, thank you, and thank you for all the incredible education and the fellowship experiences you've provided to our Specialized Women's Health Fellows. I know our recent graduate, Dr. Fifik, uh, certainly benefited greatly, and Dr. Sabrina uh, Sani, who's now at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, uh, also um, did the Medical uh, Breast uh, Fellowship with you. So it's really been great professionally. And it's been fun and wonderful to know you personally. And I just want you to know the martini teas Uh that I ordered for you have come in. (laughs) Yes, we like to golf, and oh, golf is a form fun. of exercise, Very right? Fun. And doesn't staying doesn't staying in shape somewhat help reduce the risk of breast you know, cancer? People always wonder about breast cancer risk factors, and really, uh, attaining and maintaining your ideal body weight is one of the main things that a person can do to reduce their breast cancer risk. Um, the the other thing, you know, exercise is really important and limiting alcohol consumption. Some people are even suggesting now that women don't have any alcohol who may be uh, at increased risk. Uh, others suggest three to seven drinks per week. Uh, you know, I think alcohol in moderation probably is still debatable as being okay. Um, and... Uh, of course, in your arena, the, the use of combined hormone replacement therapy after menopause does slightly increase one's risk, but I really want to talk more about that. So those are the three things, you know, get out there and exercise like Dr. Thacker and I did last weekend. Uh, keep your body weight slim. Except- Yes, except we did hit the 19th hole well, we did. with alcohol. We did. <laughs> but what I tell my patients with alcohol is it's better to not imbibe. You don't need to do it for heart disease. But if you're a social alcohol drinker and it's associated with being social and taking care of yourself and exercising, I try to tell people to limit it to no more than three to five. So I heard you go up to seven for women. 
But I also say if you are a drinker, then you better have folic acid because that helps with cellular repair and vitamin D, which you get when you're out golfing. And just a normal amount of folic acid is probably sufficient, that which is provided in a, in a regular multivitamin. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, people wonder about deodorants and they get emails and they wonder about plastics and pesticides. The bottom line is we don't know a lot about environmental risk factors. There's not enough data, um, you know, to, to really make any solid recommendations on that front. You know, it's interesting that you list long-term combined um, estrogen progestin as an increased risk for diagnosis. And I would say that I have um, colleagues uh, uh, who I've had actually on our CME medical podcast, Dr. Phil Sorrell. I haven't yet had Dr. Howard Hodis. But when they looked at the Women's Health Initiative data with the estrogen plus progestin arm, which is medroxyprogesterone acetate, very anti-estrogenic. What they found, even though the conclusion of the study was there was one extra case of breast cancer diagnosed per 1,000 women if you had been on combined hormone therapy for 5 to 10 years, what they found comparing it to the literature is that the placebo group in the WHI had a much lower than average diagnosis of breast cancer. So I will tell you that there are people in my field who don't believe that there's any significant increased risk of breast cancer diagnosis, and certainly not ovarian cancer, which we'll also touch on too today, with long-term hormone therapy, and certainly estrogen alone therapy, at least with Premarin conjugated estrogens, for studied up to 11 years in hysterectomized American women, even into the 70s showed a reduction not just in diagnosis, but invasiveness and overall reductions in death. So... That you are absolutely correct. And and I want to say that I, I want to debunk this myth with you. I completely agree with you. And I think that so many women suffer and are afraid of hormone uh, replacement therapy after menopause. And you really have to look at the absolute risk increase that occurs uh, with, uh, with combined estrogen and progestin therapy. An average 60-year-old woman has a five-year estimated uh, uh, risk of breast cancer of 1.67%. The combined therapy increases that risk by 26%, which the media blew way out of proportion, and it frightened women. But if you Mm -hmm. increase your risk, which is over the next five years, 1.67% by 26%, you're up to a whopping 2.1%. So, you know, if you're absolutely miserable, uh, as I was uh, with when menopause hit, um, you know, if you're willing to undertake a half a percent risk increase, uh, I think that that's, that should be a woman's conversation and a woman's choice. Mm -hmm. And that is in diagnosis, not death, because really the bottom line is no one wants any disease and no one wants to be diagnosed with breast cancer. We all have loved ones, family, friends, neighbors, patients, uh, co-workers that have been diagnosed with breast cancer, but you really don't want to die prematurely and you don't want to die from breast cancer. And I think there's been so many ex- um, advances in targeted therapy for even metastatic breast cancer that I have, I think there's a lot of hope out there if you are um, a breast cancer survivor. And I've done prior podcast on um, the care that breast cancer survivors need and treatment of genital urinary atrophy and treating a woman just as you would any other woman because most women with breast cancer die from all the things all the rest of us die from, right? Right. And you've you've included about eighteen <laughs> topics in those in those sentences <laughs> by design. That that's that that's your nature. So um, you know when you talk about identifying high risk women early you know, it's yes. that dreaded early onset aggressive breast cancer that we want to avoid at all costs. Yes. And in fact, uh, young black women are twice as likely 
to get breast cancer at an early age and to get triple negative breast cancer than white women are. They're more likely to show a cancer on their first mammogram. And in the Ashkenazi population, one out of every 40 individuals, not just women, but men too, carry BRCA mutations, which markedly increase their risk for breast and ovarian cancer in women and prostate cancer in men. Uh, We'll talk more about that. But, you know, the uh, USPSTF, the United States Preventive Services Task Force, in 2016, kind of, in my mind, took a little step back uh, by recommending mammography to be initiated at the age of 50 uh, as compared to 40. It's been shown that 19% of cases of breast cancer occur in women under the age of 50 and 11% of deaths. One out of every six years of life lost to breast cancer is due to women diagnosed in their 40s. And the odds of Uh, getting breast cancer in your 40s is not that different than your odds of getting it in your 50s. It just may be that there is a slight increase in mammographic callbacks and sometimes false positive biopsies with earlier screening due to density. But a woman, again, needs to make that choice as to whether she wants to... uh, take advantage of the 20 to 40% mortality reduction by starting mammography annually at the age of 40, um, which the USPSTF has now moved it to 40, but they still are recommending every other year. The Cleveland Clinic, National Comprehensive Cancer Network, Society of Breast Imaging, and American College of Radiology all recommend that we start screening at the age of 40 and do it every year. And the American College of Radiology has really argued to try to get at those young women and risk assess to the best that we can uh, who, you know, who may have a strong family history and, and need to go for genetic counseling or genetic testing to try to identify those families at risk before they get cancer. We'll be back after a quick break. Hey, quick question for you. Are you someone who wants to be fit, healthy, and happy? And what if I told you you could get your dream body by simply just listening to a podcast? I'm Josh. And I'm KG, and we are the hosts of the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast. Listen, we get it. Fitness isn't easy. Carbs, no carbs. Just stop, okay? It doesn't have to be that complicated. And that's why we made this podcast. We get straight to the facts so you can become your best you. So the way to check us out is click the link in the show notes or go search Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast on any of the major podcast platforms. We'll see you soon. And, and that's why I do think family history is so important. But obviously, some of our patients don't know their family history. They may be adopted. And, and now, increasingly, with people getting these over-the-counter uh, genetic tests, they're finding out 10% of the time maybe one of their biological parents isn't their biological parent uh, and that they have other relatives they didn't know about. And so there's a lot of um, interesting aspects to that. Getting back to uh, those black women with earlier breast cancer, more aggressive breast cancers, and the triple negative, which is, of course, harder to treat, how much of do you think is that um, from their polymorphic genetic uh, predispositions versus vitamin D versus other factors? You know, we've tried to look at multi-gene panel testing to look at what we call the highly penetrant genes, the really bad genes like BRCA1 and BRCA2, and the moderately penetrant genes like CHECK2 and ATM, there's a whole smattering of genes uh, that are associated with breast cancer. There hasn't been a real link to one of those genes uh, with these young women, but I've been involved recently in a study uh, with Alicia Hughes at Myriad Genetics looking at all women diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, and it did appear that something called the polygenic risk score 
was elevated in young women who developed uh, triple negative breast cancer. And that could be a way in the future to substratify women to know who's at risk and who may benefit, say, from MRI screening or preventive medication. And in the case of these very, very high-risk mutations, even risk-reducing surgeries. You also brought up an interesting point about about uh, women who have metastatic disease and the hope that's provided by these PARP inhibitors. Uh, there's, there's, yes. a, there's a new medication. It's not really new. We've, we've been looking at it since about 1990. You know, this is how American medicine changes. But um, basically, the BRCA-associated tumors are unable to repair their DNA in one arm of of their pathway and so they rely on another arm of the repair pathway in order to stay alive now that other arm is governed by that enzyme parp so if you block it you can't repair the dna Uh, the double-stranded DNA breaks on the one side because you don't have that capability. That's what BRCA genes do. And you don't Mm -hmm. have ability on the other side. And so it's become commonplace now. And we call it mainstreaming, where medical oncologists are very commonly ordering uh, genetic testing in order to uh, provide patients with the latest, uh, the latest and the greatest therapies. So you have um, genetic counselors and geneticists uh, who who traditionally ordered these tests. Other genetic professionals who have been ch- trained in the field now medical oncologists and now patients can order their own genetic testing uh, direct to consumer. That's something I'd like to say something about just because yes. there, there, it's really important to sort out the difference between fun genetic testing or recreational genetic testing yes, and medical genetic testing. They are both yes. available direct to consumer, but that, you know, recreational form, uh, you know, say the Ancestry.com or, or your earwax or that type of thing, you know. Um, or 23 and Me. The 23 yeah. and Me, it's really a SNP based kind of encyclopedia, it's a spot checking. They aren't truly sequencing the DNA. And even when it's sent on for additional analysis, it's, o- it's only being spot checked. And there are a lot of false positives. And so mm-hmm. um, I've had very, very bright women come in and say, oh, not to worry, I've been tested. And 23andMe offers an option where you can have the three most common mutations seen in the Ashkenazi population, two in BRCA1 and one in BRCA2, tested. But the problem with that is, if you, if you are Ashkenazi, it's one in 40 individuals which will have that gene, and then you've not tested for the other 10,000 BRCA1 and BRCA2 variants, as well as all the rest of the genes that could be involved. Mm -hmm. And 19% of uh, breast cancers in Jewish women are due to other genes besides those three. And if you aren't Jewish, it almost essentially is irrelevant. (laughs) And so you really have to look for something called next generation sequencing, which is a Full mm-hmm. sequencing of the DNA that is truly, you know, clinical grade and actionable. And so um, y- not everyone knows that there's a real difference between those two. And, you know, while most genetic counselors think that the um, that the entertainment, you know, value is, is, is important for people, they, they don't agree with uh, the sort of recreational medical testing. I do have one fun uh, 
group, a family in my practice where there's a very rare mutation uh, called P10, and it, it causes a, mm-hmm. a, a rare syndrome, which Dr. Karis Eng is, is really the, the world expert in, a P10 hamartoma tumor syndrome. And mm-hmm. three girls were, um, were uh, adopted at birth to different families. Um, this family split up, and these three sisters were adopted by different families and found each other with this Ancestry.com, mm-hmm. and they all yes, carry yes. a mutation in the P10 gene, and they meet up to, to come in together. So it's really, it's really, you know, kind of neat in some ways, uh, but can't be to bring people on together in, another, in, in other ways. Yeah, my son, who has his um, PhD in molecular medicine and genomics, who worked with Dr. Ang, did a lot of research on the on the P10 gene. And when there was recreational testing in my family, we found out additional family members and a significant percent of Ashkenazi uh, Jewish descent, which my husband's like, oh, now I thought I married a Swedish woman. <laughs> Now I know why you're so exacting. I said, no, it's why I'm so smart, oh, dear. That's cute. Uh, so, so I was talking to my son because, you know, you said one in 40, you know, for BRCA gene. He's like, mom, you're too old. You would, you're too old to have an early breast cancer. I'm like, okay, I guess that's one good thing about getting older. So what are the scenarios that really people should be thinking about yeah. getting medical grade genetic testing? So that's just a great question. And you bring up, you know, you bring up, up a good point about how much Ashkenazi ancestry is worrisome. And Dr. Mm-hmm. Eng, you know, has kind of said it, it that we wouldn't particularly offer testing in a family without any family history unless there was Mm -hmm. sort of the equivalent of one grandparent or 25 percent Ashkenazi ancestry but I have patients with one to two percent Ashkenazi ancestry who have uh, BRCA mutation so who needs to worry you know women who have a personal or family history of being diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 50 or earlier, early onset disease, breast cancer that occurs in more than one spot, whether it's more than one spot, two tumors on the same breast or a tumor on both sides, even at different times, that's a red flag. Triple negative breast cancer is a red flag for BRCA1 mutations. Um, and uh, in fact, about 80 to 90 percent of women with BRCA1 mutations who do develop breast cancer before the age of 50 will have a triple negative disease. After the age of 50, it kind of flip-flops, and they tend to develop mm-hmm. more ER positive or estrogen sensitive breast cancers. And those can, you know, the risk of those can be reduced by risk-reducing medication if women are interested. Um, Lobular breast cancer is a particular type of breast cancer that, um, you know, the the breast is made up of milk glands that that contain lobules. Most of the time, 85% of the time, cancer starts in the milk ducts that lead to the nipple. Mm -hmm. But about 15% of the time, it can be lobular. And if there is a family history, particularly of gastric cancer, there's a rare gene that can link lobular breast cancer with gastric cancer, believe it or not. And if if people have that gene, uh, one of the options is actually to have a laparoscopic uh, gastrectomy or removal of the stomach because the risk is so high. Male breast cancer is another red flag. You know, when men get breast cancer, it can be a sign of BRCA2. It's uh, very rare for men to get breast cancer in the general population. Anyone who is Jewish and has had breast or ovarian cancer in the female population or pancreatic and in the male population, prostate cancer or pancreatic cancer or breast cancer in men should definitely be tested. Um, and 
a family history of any of those things would also qualify a patient for genetic testing. Now, if you decide that you want to have genetic testing and you don't meet the criteria for genetic testing, the direct-to-consumer companies will still provide it uh, at the same cost as they would to a patient who meets criteria. The difference is they would not try to submit it to insurance. And the cost mm-hmm. has come down from about $6,000 to $250. Wow. So, yeah, that's that's something. You know, I kind of talked about those big genes and the middle genes. There are also itty bitty genes, you know? <laughs> so so the the highly penetrant genes like BRCA1 or BRCA2 and others like P10, you're more likely than not over the course of your lifetime to get breast cancer. So that's what you're that's what you're faced with. And in fact a large study out of Ontario looking at a a BRCA population who was followed with MRI screening showed that even when they were watched very carefully, about 26% had stage 2 disease or above, and over 50% still had to have chemotherapy. So even when you're being watched really closely, you know, you're up against mm-hmm. a lot. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's just really important to identify these patients early. We'll be back after a quick break. Have you ever experienced fitness failure? You know, you set a, a goal to exercise, you're all excited, and then you're not. Hi, I'm Dave. I host the daily 10-minute podcast, Walking is Fitness. Instead of an exercise goal, I talk about making a fitness promise. And every day you keep that promise, you add another link to a growing fitness chain. This is a podcast of action. You'll create a fitness habit, which eventually becomes fitness momentum, and then on to all kinds of good stuff. Check it out. Walking is fitness, and let's take a daily 10-minute walk together. And knowledge is power. And I know in the past people were afraid because they didn't want to be discriminated in the workforce or with medical insurance. But but those concerns have been allayed with legislation. Right. In in 2008, um, the GINA law was was, uh, passed, uh, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, whereby uh, you cannot be discriminated against in your workplace or with your health insurance based on genetic information. And, you know, breast cancer is really just at the cutting edge of medicine in terms of genetic association. Probably Mm -hmm. most things are going to turn out to be genetic. I believe probably alcohol tolerance included will probably turn out to be genetic (laughs) or genomic. Um, and, uh, And so... You know, we have not seen litigation and problems with genetic testing, and I've been in this field since 1997. And so, you know, I, I would have seen a lot of cases, you know, if they were, if they were coming up. We, we really haven't seen problems with insurance and such. Which is very reassuring. And I think knowledge is power because there are things that people can proactively do. You obviously can't change your genetics at this point in time, despite not yet with CRISPR and other your things. Your son will work on um, that. <laughs> but we certainly can do a lot of lifestyle things that you mentioned. I have a large population of women with genetic mutations in my practice, many of them because of early menopause after they're done with childbearing, usually by age 40, sometimes earlier with BRCA1. It's recommended that the tubes and ovaries come out, and I feel very strongly, and I know you've done research in this area along with Dr. Fifik and uh, team, that women who are done with childbearing who uh, have a genetic mutation, who are going to be castrated and have their ovaries and tubes out, have the uterus out so they can just take estrogen. But that's not standard of care exactly at this point in time, Well, and you, you talk about it as if estrogen would be a default 
And that is not the case in outside of the walls <laughs> where we work. So I want to I wanna talk a little bit about uh, hormone in the high-risk patient, whether it's family history or a genetic mutation uh, or just fear. You know, it's really important to look at the absolute increase in risk with any, uh, with any medication that you're going to be taking. Young women with BRCA mutations worry even about birth control pills, as do their families. Um, And there have been two large meta-analyses showing that there was no significant increased risk of breast cancer in patients with BRCA mutations who take oral contraceptives. And certainly, women who have early surgical menopause need that estrogen to reduce their risk of early cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis and a number of other uh, uh, it, you know, issues that, that can be affected by early surgical menopause, which I'm sure you can tell us a lot more about than, than I. But I think that um, many, many physicians are afraid to give those women hormone after their ovaries come out for fear of breast cancer. And that simply is not the case. We do not see any increased risk in breast cancer. And in fact, in patients with BRCA2 mutations, having the ovaries out before the age of 45 reduces breast cancer risk by 55%. And that risk reduction is not affected by hormone replacement therapy. So hormone is safe, really, in this, in this population. Well, I frequently have um, patients in my practice who have, of course, offspring who are too young to be tested, but maybe they are still um, young adults or older teenagers. And I routinely recommend regardless of sexual activity status, as long as there's not clotting problems or other high-risk medical issues, that the female children get on hormonal contraceptives to reduce ovulation, to reduce ovarian cancer, which is true in the general population. Just like completely removing the tubes with tubal ligation reduces ovarian cancer. And so even if you don't have BRCA gene, if you're choosing to have a tubal ligation, you should have the whole tube removed. And that's called a salpingectomy. And I recommend that all the time as an alternative to vasectomy or, you know, tubal ligation. Having your tubes removed really uh, prevents ovarian cancer because it's felt that almost all ovarian cancers originate in the in the fallopian tubes. And there are even studies underway looking at having your tubes removed with a BRCA mutation and having the ovaries removed later so that you can undergo your own natural menopause. Trials are being done to make sure that that's safe. That is not currently standard of care yet. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think that all women can do, and certainly high-risk women, and it's sad because I'll even see physicians and people that you think would be um, able to have the most cutting-edge information is to obviously clean up the lifestyle, not smoke. Uh, High-risk people, I really don't think, should be regularly imbibing alcohol and correct vitamin D levels. Uh, There's so many benefits, including, you know, boosting vitamin D levels and reducing diabetic risk, infection, depression, arthritis. I really think that's cheap and safe and effective, and I don't think it's emphasized enough. Oh, you and I have been on that same boat for, what, you know, 30 years? And, you know, (laughs) it's something simple that that somebody can do to improve their bone health, their breast health, and many other, you know, uh, body systems and and pathways. Um, And and it's it's something that patients, you know, do feel empowered by. To, to you know to reduce to reduce their risk it's hard to know exactly how much that can reduce risk because the studies are largely retrospective and epidemiologic relying on patient recall and and the studies that have been done have looked at such low doses that they are not 
uh, effective in getting normal blood levels. So you and I, uh, again, are on the same page with vitamin D, that's for sure. You know, back to those, back to those genes. So you've got those high-risk genes and the moderate-risk genes. And, you know, check to an ATM are really, really common in the general population. About 1.5% of, uh, of people of European descent uh, carry check 2 or ATM mutations. And it's not the same as having a BRCA mutation. You know, it's more of like a risk factor, like elevated cholesterol, you know, there's, there's a, a 30% increased risk of getting breast cancer as compared to with BRCA, a 70% risk. So people need to really realize, you know, don't panic. Many of these gene tests will pick up um, abnormalities that may not ever cause a person any issues. However, those little genes that I talked about, that third layer of genetic uh, information, they're called SNPs. And there's over 300 SNPs that have been associated with breast cancer. And you inherit some from your mom and some from your dad. So your complement of, of SNPs may be completely different, say, than your sister's complement of SNPs. And whether you have a mutation or don't have a mutation, that combination of SNPs can affect your breast cancer risk. And so what I see coming down the pike in terms of uh, risk substratification for particularly younger women is not only this polygenic risk score, which we've written columns about, so people can refer back to that in terms of the speaking of women's health audience. Um, but uh, there are other developments like artificial intelligence reviewing mammograms, and they're able to stratify risk levels by looking at the mammographic patterning. Isn't that amazing? That is fascinating. Speaking of mammograms, I mean, I think that, uh, and I, I've been talking with Dr. Holly Peterson, a medical breast expert leading in the nation, uh, and we're in the Sunflower House, and we have been talking about all things breast and breast cancer and breast screening and genetics and genomics and polygenic risk. And for more information, Dr. Peterson has authored several columns on speakingofwomenshealth.com. But going to the flip side, I think we've made the point that um, starting early, uh, yearly mammograms, particularly uh, if the woman with shared decision making wants to do that because of those early, more aggressive cancers. And obviously having breast cancer at age 40 is a lot more devastating than being diagnosed with say DCIS, which is stage zero when you're 65 from routine screening, which could be actually over diagnosis. So that gets me to the American Cancer Society's recommendation, which I came to before they did actually, but certainly it's nice to have the backing of the American Cancer Society that if you're just average risk from age 55 to 75, you should have mammography every two years. And by age 75, you get to graduate. And I have lots of healthy women that I've helped keep healthy who are in their 80s and 90s and going strong, but they've been so programmed that they need their yearly mammogram as if that's therapeutic, which it's not. It's diagnostic potentially and isn't really the best screening test, unfortunately, although there's been some improvements. So I have a lot of women who end up with histories of hysterectomy who are on estrogen alone who go and have their screening mammogram because they can walk in in lots of places even without a doctor's order and get one and then get a biopsy and then they can't take their hormones oh, anymore. Oh, Holly, Holly. So that's kind of the flip too side. Many, too many thoughts in your sentences again. <laughs> so, you know, you bring, you bring up a, a really good point and you bring up a lot of really good points. First of all, we cannot at the present time identify low-risk women. Perhaps in the future with this uh, artificial intelligence evaluating the mammogram combined with the polygenic risk score and traditional risk factors, we'll have a better idea as to who is low-risk. 
But presently, 75% of women who get breast cancer do not have identifiable risk factors. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when a woman is told at the age of 40, you have at least a 20% reduction in mortality from breast cancer by having yearly mammograms. It's, you know, typically quite convincing. The, you know, the other thing a lot of women wonder about, and I'll get to when do you stop in a minute, but, um, but what about density? You know, there's four categories of breast density and about half of all women are mammographically dense. They either have extremely dense tissue or heterogeneously dense tissue. And many of those women can benefit from what we call supplemental imaging. And that's becoming more of a national trend and is, is a lot more, mm-hmm. uh, in, you know, legislative at this point. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of, of guidance for women to get, to get additional screening if they are mammographically dense. Um, and you're talking about the 3D tomograms. So I so right. there that's a great question. What do you do if you're dense? The 3D is almost standard of care at this point if it's available. Most women get the 3D um, really unless they're pregnant and we can talk briefly about about that. Um, mammograms are safe during pregnancy and lactation. And MRI screening is safe during lactation. So if, if a very, very high-risk person wants to have a mammogram and they're due while they're pregnant, it's okay to have. The um, dosage from a four-view mammogram is 0.03 milligray, and the toxic dose is greater than 50 milligray. So there's like a 600-fold difference between, mm-hmm. you know, the radiation exposure that you get um, when when you have that done. So the American Cancer Society actually is very aligned with Cleveland Clinic uh, Cleveland Clinic's care path where women between age 40 and 44 have the option for yearly um, tomosynthesis if that's what they want. If they do start at 40, we do recommend that they go annually rather than every other year. From 45 Mm -hmm. to 55, both uh, CCF and ACS recommend annual mammograms. And then you're right, from 56 to 74, it can be every year or every other year at the discretion of the patient and her uh, treating provider. Uh, But much of the world does stop screening at 74. And, you know, I found this really interesting table uh, that the Social Security Administration actually puts out for people to plan their retirement, you know. And if you live to (laughs) age 70, the average duration that you will go on to live is 17.6 years. To a, to a ripe old age of 87.6. If you live to 80, you're likely to live to 90. And if you live to 90, you, you're likely to live to 95. And so if someone is really healthy, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for us to continue mammographic screening as long as the patient is is healthy in your in your opinion uh, because those women can still develop you know develop disease and often do in their in their older years yeah I just think that just with the false positives and with a lot of women with DCIS being treated as if they have cancer and they're already at the end of their life it's just to me reminiscent of prostate cancer where there's a lot more selective screening. And in the past, I used to think, well, you take out the prostate, the man's many times incontinent, impotent, that's a terrible quality of life. Whereas I always thought, oh, the breast, extra tissue, it's fat tissue, unless you're lactating, you really don't need it. I mean, psychologically, there's issues, but it's just not a deep internal organ. But now that we know that hormone therapy is associated with a longer lifespan, if the woman's on hormone therapy and has no symptoms and is enjoying her life, I really don't like to medicalize people. And 
you know, when we have such long wait times sometimes, like I was recently discussing with you for diagnostic mammogram, it just seems like for healthy people without symptoms, you know, people should be able to graduate from some of this intensive screening. No one wants to die prematurely well, of cancer. But it, I that's my perspective. I am willing <laughs> to have a long drive contest over this. <laughs> so... Um, well, we know you're going to win the long drive. <laughs> you know, the benefits of screening in older women are really the same as that in younger women, except they're more likely to, to be detected early and to have less aggressive treatment, lower morbidity, and lower mortality. Um, you know, but it's... Isn't, isn't, but isn't that because some of it is falsely diagnosed, similar to prostate cancer? And I know, like, a lot of thyroid cancers are overdiagnosed and even renal cancers. I went to a nephrology appointment with one of my donors and you know, you would think, oh, you have two kidneys. If you've got a lesion of cancer on one, you just take it out. And they're following because the whole biology of tumors, I just think it's not as cut and dry as if it's looks abnormal that it's definitely going to kill you. Well, you know, you you bring up a, a good point that the the worry about aggressive screening is over diagnosis and over treatment. Now, over treatment is something that has been well studied with multiple randomized control trials over long periods of time. And, you know, we went from the Halstead radical mastectomy to the simple mastectomy oh, yes. Terrible. to uh, less invasive axillary surgery to observation of, you know, of different entities. And so that that is is headed in a less aggressive direction but this this notion of over diagnosis of cancers that would never cause you any harm there is no imaginable way at the present time that we can determine if those exist or which ones they are you know and so that's, you know that's the problem with it once you get that diagnosis, then then you get the diagnosis. But I do emphasize to my patients that some cancers we clearly know early diagnosis of precancerous lesions like skin cancer, like cervical cancer, really make a difference. Uterine cancer, um, breast but, cancer you know, too. It's in a, breast cancer too. Yeah. We could I, do I a putting contest. What if... about a putting contest? <laughs> A putting contest. Yeah, that would be more up my alley. But uh, it's really all fascinating. And the fact that therapy has really changed so much. And you and I work in a building named after Barney Cryle, who was thrown out of the surgical societies because he recommended lumpectomy instead of this radical, radical terrible surgery taking off the muscle and the whole chest wall. So it's really exciting that I think we've come a long way and I think we're going to go even farther. And it's been so wonderful having you, Dr. Holly Peterson, in the Sunflower House talking all things breast, mammography, genetics, screening, controversies, risk factors, things that women can do, how to be proactive and not be afraid. It really fits into our theme of be strong, be healthy, and be in charge. So thank you all for joining us in the Sunflower House. I am your host, Dr. Holly Thacker. If you don't get our free e-newsletter, please sign up and you can subscribe anywhere you get podcasts, Apple iTunes, Google, Amazon Music. And um, I'll look forward to seeing you back in the Sunflower House. And I'll look forward to seeing Dr. Peterson on the golf course and hopefully back in the Sunflower House with us.